Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Greeting this morning from the El Shaddai Ministries and to all the believers and to all the listeners to the internet worldwide, in Jamaica, in Europe, Israel, everywhere. God bless you this morning. Shabbat Shalom. We have a great day today. Get ready. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, as we gather together on this Shabbat, <clears throat> it is such a blessing to be here in your presence, dear Lord. And we are so grateful for our pastor, Pastor Mark, who teaches us your Torah. And we ask you to continually anoint him and bless him, Lord. And we are so grateful for the people of this congregation. It is such a blessing to gather together on your Shabbat with like-minded people who love you and love your Torah. We are truly blessed, Lord. And I just want to lift up uh, the land of Israel and, and just pray for the leadership in Israel as you look at Israel and you see all the chaos and all the turmoil as the nations are uh, just in turmoil and going against Israel. And I pray that you will give the leadership, the uh, knowledge and the wisdom to make the right decision and stand strong. And I pray for the land, for the United States, that we stand strong with Israel in these difficult times as one nation. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, amen. It's absolutely great to have Pastor Mark back. Hopefully he brought his voice with him. He was kind of struggling a little bit uh, last week, but uh, Pastor Mark, it's all yours. What a beautiful Shabbat. It's a little chilly this morning, wasn't it? But I tell you what, it's warm in here. This is kind of an exciting tour portion. Believe it or not, it is one of my favorites. And many of you are familiar with this, the, the story here. In Genesis 28, verse 10 is where the Torah portion begins. And it talks about how Jacob went out from Beersheba and he went toward Haran. Well, let's go ahead and put our first clip up. Here's the name of our Torah portion. Anyone know what that says? Okay. Vayetze. Now, you might wonder, you know, when you see this, you think of like dark clouds, ominous, the sun is setting. Well, look at the very next verse in Genesis 28, 11. It says how Jacob <clears throat> lighted upon a certain place, not just any place. This is what's so significant. There's little hints that you're going to find in the text. But here he came upon a certain place and he tarried there all night because the sun was set. <clears throat> so here it is. Jacob's descent. He's leaving the land of promise. Remember Esau's out to kill him and he's on the run. How many of you sometimes have felt like you were on the run from situations, you know, and you didn't know where you were headed. It's dark, it's gloomy. And here he is leaving the promised land. And so the Torah, I believe, has it like this because they want to communicate Jacob leaving the promised land is symbolic of spiritual darkness. He's leaving it. It's a time of spiritual darkness. Well, what's interesting is in next week's Torah portion, he's coming back to the promised land. And look at verse Genesis 32 of 31 of next week's Torah portion. What do we find? And he passed over Penuel, and what? The sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. So here we see the sun is setting as he's leaving the promised land. And now he's coming back after wrestling with the angel next week, and the sun is rising. Everything is great. He's re-entering the promised land. All right, so I wanted to show you here what we have. Now, this is Abraham's journey in particular, not necessarily Jacob's, but here's the Ur of Chaldees and how Abraham went up through Babylon, through Nineveh, over here to Haran. If you remember, Abraham had two brothers, Nahor and Haran. Haran died in the Ur of the Chaldees. And uh, what happens, he ends up settling in Haran for a little while. And uh, you'll notice this word I have underlined here, Padanaram. Okay, this is a, this area is Padanaram. And Jacob is down here where this other underline is in Beersheba. And so Jacob is on the run and he's going to go up to this area to find one of Abraham's relatives that uh, he could marry. But what I want to point out here is here's north, here's south. 
This is east, this is west. So even though this is northeast, I want you to consider all of this is east going this way. Is everyone following me? Heading east. Well, in Genesis 3, 24, something I want to point out. Do you remember when Adam and Eve had sinned? It says how God had drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now, if you go back to this map here, uh, and if you want to disagree with me, that's fine. But I really believe the promise, the Garden of Eden, I mean, the Garden of Eden, I believe was here, not over here in this area. I believe the Garden of Eden was here. And I believe that the angels were put on guard and everyone left the Garden of Eden, the promised land initially, and went east. They were expelled to the east. And uh, if you'll notice in Genesis 4, 16, after Cain killed Abel, what does it say? He went out from the presence of the Lord. He dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. So whatever you see, rejection, uh, they always end up going where? East. What do we see in Genesis 24, verse 4 through 6? Here it says, You shall go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. Okay, do you remember? Isaac and uh, Abraham told Eliezer, I want you to go find a wife for my son Isaac. I do not want my son Isaac leaving the promised land. He is not to leave the promised land. You leave the promised land. You get him a wife and you bring her back here. It says, I want you to, it says, the servants uh, said to him, peradventure, what if the woman is not willing to follow me to this land? Must I need bring your son again to the land from whence you came? And Abraham said to him, beware that you bring not my son there again. In other words, Abraham concerning Isaac said to Eliezer, he is not going east. He is staying over here. So what do we find in Genesis 25, 5 through 6? If you remember, Keturah, after Sarah died, Abraham also uh, marries Keturah, has several kids. And what does it say? Abraham gave all that he had to his son Isaac. But to the sons of the concubines which Abraham had, Abraham did give him gifts. And he sent them away from Isaac, his son, while he yet lived. And where did they go? Eastward, to the east country. So again, even though they were loved, they weren't the promised ones. And so where do they have to go? East. So Keturah and the kids were blessed, but they were sent away. Now, don't you think they felt rejected a little bit? <clears throat> you know, I mean, the, the whole Bible, we can look at this a little bit more, is, is a lot of it is about being rejected. So Isaac, he's the inheritor of the promised land. He stays. He even stays when it comes to getting a wife with the LH you're going to Padanaram to find one. Okay, so what do we see now in Genesis 28, verse 1 and 2, just before our Torah portion begins here in verse 10, so we can get the setting. It says, Isaac called Jacob, and he blessed him, and he charged him and said to him, I don't want you to take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise and go to Padanaram. And Genesis 29, 1, it says, Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. Now think about this. Esau... He gets to stay in a promised land. So despite his father blessing, Jacob may have had ample reason to doubt his father really meant it. First of all, only the day before, his father had really planned to give the primary blessing to his older brother Esau all along. Secondly, Jacob's parents had just sent him away from Israel to the east. And Esau is the one that's staying. So, you know, he probably had a few rejection issues himself, not only from... Uh, you know, Esau felt rejected too, but how about Jacob? He felt rejected by his parents, I think, to a large extent. I mean, it's one thing, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but Jacob wasn't a young fellow, and he probably lived up his whole life seeing his father preferring uh, Esau. So what I want to do here, let's take a look. <clears throat> For all or any of these reasons, it's easy to understand why Jacob may have needed some divine reassurance before embarking on his journey to Padanaram. So let's step back and with Jacob, kind of remember the times when God appeared to Grandpa Abraham and Daddy Isaac. You know Abraham told the story to Isaac about how God appeared to him, and he also told it to his grandson Jacob. And you know Isaac, I'm sure, told uh, his son Jacob about how Grandpa tried to kill him, you know, uh, uh, up there on the Temple Mount. And I'm sure Abraham may have told a different version than Isaac did to the grandson. But uh, anyway, let's go back and take a look 
at the very first time when God appeared to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, it says, the Lord said to Abraham or Abram, get out of your country from your kindred, from your father's house to a land that I'll show you and I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. You'll be a blessing. I'll bless them that bless you, curse them that curse you, and in you will all the families of the earth be blessed. So when Abraham hears this great divine promise, what does Abraham, how does he respond in verse 7? It says, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, unto your seed will I give this land. And so what does Abram do? He builds an altar to the Lord who appeared to him. If you'll notice, Abram did not make a vow at all. He just said, hey, great. This is great. And he built an altar and worshiped the Lord. So now let's look at Genesis 26, 24, the first time when God appeared to Isaac to pass on the blessing of the land. It says the Lord God appeared to him, Isaac, the same night. And he said, I am the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not, I'm with you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to multiply your seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And so how did Isaac respond? What did he do? He built an altar and he called upon the name of the Lord. Again, Isaac did not make any vows when the Lord appeared to him. Okay, so let's go back now and complete our very first verse as God is about to appear to Jacob for the very first time. And let's look at how Jacob's response differs from Abraham's and Isaac's. What do we see here? Genesis 28, 11, it says he lighted upon a certain place. He tarried it all night because the sun was set. And then it says, he took up the stones of that place and he put them for his pillows. And he laid down in that place to sleep. Remember before it was a certain place. Now it's that place. It doesn't say a place. Whenever you have the, the definite article, the, or that, it's a specific place he's talking about. Well, here's the thing. The Torah's depiction of Jacob at this point is a man on the run. He's fleeing the Holy Land. So the Torah kind of describes him as someone who's very afraid. He's afraid of many things. He's afraid of his brother Esau. He's afraid to travel in the dark because the sun had set. He sleeps out in the wild. And it says he took from the stones of that place and put them at his head, probably for protection from wild animals. I mean, I would too. I have a bunch of stones around my head in case any animal comes in the middle of the night, I can grab my pillow or stone and throw it at him, you know. <clears throat> and in his dream or vision, Jacob is shown that God will offer him protection. It's a fitting prelude to God's promise that follows. So here God's saying, look, I'm going to protect you. You can see Jacob is very fearful. Genesis 28, 15, what does God say to Jacob. He says, behold, I am with you. I'm going to protect you wherever you go. And I'm going to bring you again to this land. I will not leave you until I've done that which I've spoken to you of. Wow, that's a pretty powerful promise. So what is this blessing that uh, God says to Jacob? He says, look, I'm with you. But look at it another way. He says, I do not promise that it'll be comfortable or that you won't suffer. I don't promise you'll never be hungry or feel despair. I don't promise that your heart will never be broken. My promise is simply that I'm going to be with you through all this. In your suffering, your hunger, your despair, through your wandering, your stumbling, your confusion, I'm with you even when you feel abandoned and rejected. And I think that's an important point for us to realize too. Sometimes we think that when we become believers, everything's going to be great. Uh, God says, no, not everything's going to be great, but guess what? I'm going to be with you through all of this. Now, here's the other thing. Here, Jacob is on the run from Esau. How old do you think Jacob is here? He's around 63. I think about it. I don't know if you know anyone who's around 63 here. But, Tom, you're 63. So, right there. Okay. Right. That gives you an idea. That's how old Jacob was when he's on the run. <laughs> Let's look at this next clip. So, here's Jacob. He's having his dream and in Genesis 28, 12 through 14, it says, He dreamed, and behold, there was the ladder that was set upon the earth. At the top of it reached to heaven. And then notice this. It says, And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. Now, I think it's interesting to note the order. It doesn't say they were descending and then ascending. They begin with ascending. And then they're descending. And I think this is very significant. I think one thing, I can just see how... Uh, you can look at it in one way, you know, how God has angels that, here, that are here that are kind of assigned to protect us anyway. And here, Jacob, he's afraid of the dark. He's running away from home, you know, and the, he's praying out to God. I can just hear him praying out to God. And so the angel first takes his prayer up to heaven, and then angels come down with the response. 
<clears throat> but it says uh, concerning this uh, ladder, it says, behold, the Lord was standing above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. And the land whereon you're lying, to you I'm going to give it, and to your seed. And your seed will be as the dust of the earth. You'll spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south. And in you and in your seed will all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, one of the things I think is interesting about this promise too, is the land was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right? Right? But in one sense, they never inherited it, did they? In, in Hebrews, it talks about how they were looking for another house whose builder and maker is God. They never really inherited the promises. Well, you know what? This text here is proof of the resurrection of the dead because God promised that they would get it and they didn't get it during their first lifetime. So that means they're going to get it when they've uh, been raised from the dead. But here's the thing. Even though Jacob must now leave the promised land, God says, I'm going to remain with you. I'm going to take care of all your needs. And ultimately, he says, I'm going to bring you back because he's assuring Jacob, you are the chosen one. You are the chosen seed. And so God's now appearing for the first time to Jacob, promising him what sounds like the very same thing he promised Abraham and Isaac, doesn't it? <clears throat> but you know the amazing thing when you think about this, you know, he's going to get all this land, all these blessings. The amazing thing to me about Jacob is he wasn't covetous. He was willing to walk away from it all. Look at Genesis 32.10. Look at Jacob. He says, I'm less than nothing in comparison with all your mercies and your faith to me, your servant. For with only a stick in my hand, I went across Jordan and now I've become two armies. So all, all he had with him was a stick. I mean, that's, that's pretty poor. He probably kept a couple stones in his pocket though. Now look at Hebrews 13.5. It says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. This is referring directly back to the Torah. When God is speaking to Abraham, when God is speaking to Isaac, when God is speaking to Jacob, he's saying, I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you, right? Now, as believers, how many of us like to claim that verse? We all do, okay? But here's the thing. We can't steal. We got to give it back. This definitely applies to Israel. So how can the church believe in a replacement theology that teaches God has replaced Israel? If you really believe that he will never leave you nor forsake you, then you have to believe he'll never leave or forsake Israel as well. In Deuteronomy 31.8, it says, And the Lord, he it is that goes before you, he will be with you, he will not fail you, he will not forsake you, fear not nor be dismayed. He's speaking to Israel here. In the Torah. So if we really believe he'll never leave us or forsake us, we have to believe he never will leave or forsake Israel as well. Nonetheless, Jacob's reaction to God differs drastically from that of his predecessors. He doesn't build an altar at all. And he makes a vow which they never did make. <clears throat> but in Genesis 28, 16 and 17, let's look at what it says. It says, Jacob, he woke out of his sleep. And he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I didn't know it. And he was afraid. And he said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Let's go on and look at verse 20 and 22. What did Jacob do now? Now he vows a vow. And he said, okay, God, if you're going to be with me and you're going to keep me in the way that I go, and you give me bread to eat, raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. Now, that, first off, isn't that kind of fascinating? Is he, does he believe God or not? Is he saying, okay, God, if you do this, then I'll do this. Abraham just believed him and said, great. Isaac just believed him and said, great. And Jacob says, okay, if this is all true and you do bring me back, then I will do this. Verse 28, 22 goes on to say, And this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house, and of all that you shall give me, I will surely give the tenth unto you. See, Abraham never uh, offered that. Isaac never offered that. And Jacob does. Now, when he says this stone will be for a pillar, he means it'll be the cornerstone. It'll be the cornerstone of a house for God. And then in Genesis 22.4, I want to go back for a minute, 
because I kept referring to Jacob calling this place a certain place, and it's a place for the house of God. In Genesis 22, 4, when Abraham is going to sacrifice Isaac, we find on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place afar off. In Deuteronomy 16, 6, it talks about this place. He says, but at the place which the Lord your God will choose to place his name, and that's where you'll sacrifice the Passover at even. Deuteronomy 16, 16. Three times a year, so all your males appear before the Lord your God in the place. So where is the place? Jerusalem. This is why the sages say the ladder that went from earth to heaven was on Mount Moriah. That is Bethel. That is the house of God, and that's where the house of God was built. <clears throat> the place. The Torah does not directly indicate where the place was in Jacob's dream. It must be referring to the place mentioned in an earlier native, uh, narrative where Mount Moriah, this is where Grandpa Abraham uh, had bound Daddy Isaac to the altar. Can you imagine? I wonder if Jacob had ever gone to the place where Abraham had offered up Isaac. Maybe he was afraid. <laughs> but here, the reason Jacob would now experience a prophetic vision that would promise him divine protection in the land of Israel was due in part to the great sacrifice his grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac had made at this very spot many years earlier. Now here's what's fascinating. There are no gender neutral pronouns in, he in biblical Hebrew, okay? There's no it, it's him or her. And because of that, there's a midrash that says the angels of God were ascending and descending in, in our Bibles, it says upon it, but one of the levels of interpretation, they were descending upon him. It was Jacob they were ascending and descending upon. Well, Jacob becomes the latter. Well, what's fascinating about that is when you go to the Gospels of John, chapter 1, verse 51, here Yeshua uh, speaks and he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God doing what? Ascending and descending upon who? The Son of Man. So we find in one sense the rabbis were right. In one sense it was referring to a hymn, but the hymn was Yeshua. It could also, where it says upon the Son of Man, this also could be rendered as because of the Son of Man. But can you imagine when Yeshua said that, they're immediately going to be thinking of who? Jacob's dream. When he said that, they immediately made the tie back to that dream. We'll look at Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 4. Who has ascended up into heaven or descended? Note the order again of the word. It's not descended and ascended, but ascended and descended. Who gathered the wind in his fists? Who's bound the waters in a garment? Who's established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name? Very significant verse. Now, I don't have my PowerPoint right now concerning that verse, but in that verse, in a, in, in a matrix in Hebrew, where it says, what is his name? You have Hashem. And coming down where it says, what is his son's name? You have Yeshua. And it's right there in a Hebrew matrix. matrix. But apart from that, let's look at Genesis 28, 18. It says, Jacob rose up early in the morning and he took the stone. Now I have on your notes in Hebrew, the word for the stone. That first letter to the right is the letter He, which means the in English. And then you have Evan, which is the Aleph Beit in the final noon there. So uh, the Aleph Beit noon is stone. The letter He there is the. So that's the stone, which he had put at his head. And then it says he set it as a memorial pillar and he poured oil on the top of it. So what did he do? This stone that he said was going to become the cornerstone of the temple on Mount Moriah, he Mashiached it. Okay, the cornerstone, the Mashiach, gets oil poured upon it. That's the Hebrew word. So, the you know, this is the first anointing in the Torah. The very first anointing, if you look at anything being anointed, because this is 500 years before Moses anointing the priesthood, this is your very first anointing, is Jacob anointing the cornerstone. And uh, the Messiah or Mashiach, which uh, the word anoint also comes from. So when you think about this, though, who is the stone the builders rejected? 
He, he is the cornerstone. Now, let me show you this next clip. Go ahead and go to the next clip. You have it on your notes as well. I want you to notice this. Here's that word ha-evan, ha-evan, which is the stone. Here it is in English. So this is your English transliteration and the like. But the thing that's amazing to me, here's this word that's untranslated. The stone that he anoints is the Aleph Tav, Evan. And Aleph Tav refers to Yeshua, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega. So this isn't just any stone that gets anointed. It's the Aleph Tav stone, referring directly to Yeshua. I think that's quite fascinating. Let me ask you something. Does time fly when you're having fun? I mean, some people think, my goodness, we've been here for two hours and it seemed like a second, you know. But what happens to time when you're at work, you're hard at work, and uh, what happens? This is taking forever, you know. One would think time crawls at a snail's pace. But what happens when you're anticipating some event with great excitement and you're constantly counting the days and watching the clock? It takes forever. Let's go ahead and put up this next click, clip of a, here's a clock watcher. They're watching the clock. And what happens when you watch the clock? Time tends to do what? Slows down, especially when you're anticipating some exciting event. We're going to grandma's, you know, or we're going on vacation and or you're going to be out of school. You're in grade school or high school. I remember I used to think it was an eternity until I was going to graduate from high school when I was in sixth grade. You know, it's going to take forever. Well, usually when someone awaits a special event and they start counting the days, there's a slow, almost painful process of waiting minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, the time crawls on. So let me ask you this. How long did Jacob have to work for Rachel? So here he's anticipating because he did get a, he did get a have married. He wasn't married to her for seven years. He had to work for seven years. Do you think that time since he could hardly wait is going to go slow or do you think it was going to go real fast? That's exactly right. Oh, man, this is so hard. I got to wait for seven years. This is going to take forever. Well, let's look at what the Bible says. Genesis 29, 20. Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love that he had for her. Well, now, wait a minute. What's going on here? Because the normal human reaction is this is, if he could hardly wait and he has all this love for her, this is going to take forever. But it says it went just like that because of the great love that he had for her. Well, here's the thing. A definition of love is in order here before this question can be answered. Now, how many of us know uh, when we say the word love, it can mean a lot of different things. I love hot dogs and I love my wife. Okay. Can you understand how there needs to be a definition of love? Right? Well, look at this picture. How many of you love fish? I love fish. All right. So when you're thinking, I love fish, not just humans love fish. A lot of creatures love fish. Right? So some of you may have been thinking, I love fish. Right? But let me ask you this. How many of you were thinking, when you said, I love fish, were thinking this? I love fish. I I love fish so much, I don't want to eat them. I want to take care of them. So we had two different things of love going on in our minds at the same time. Some people were thinking, oh, I love fish. Consume. And other people say, oh, I love fish. Care for, take care of. So what I want to do is ask a question about the biblical word love. Okay, so a man walks into a restaurant, right? And the waitress asks for his order and the man replies, I love fish. Well, there's a foreigner sitting at the next table and he's listening. And so he pulls out his pocket dictionary and he's looking up the word love. Certain that he knows what to expect. What does he do? He watches. And he's sure this waitress is going to come bringing out this glass bowl of fish for him to take care of. Right? Well, instead, what happens? The waitress brings out 
This fish steaming hot and the customer consumes it and devours it. Clearly the patron does not harbor love for the fish. He harbors love for himself. Love in this sense would be defined or mean the enjoyment of the gratification that one receives from a food or an object or a person. In the eyes of the Torah, love is defined as the degree of caring one invests to help someone else. So in marriage, the ultimate expression of love, two spouses love one another and are always looking for ways to help each other. They love the love that they feel is the genuine caring for another individual and putting the other person first. So Jacob's seven years flew by because he viewed every single minute of work as an act of giving to Rachel. It wasn't a burden, it was a gift. So this idea applies to anything and everything we do in life. If the goal of our job is just to earn money or honor or some other gratification, then the actual work quickly becomes tedious and we fail to find satisfaction in our jobs, our marriages, and in our life. So when we are unhappy in life, we might want to examine our personal motivations, changing from a mindset of getting to a mindset of giving, and that is what will bring true satisfaction. Amen? So in our relationships, it's not what can I get out of it, and that determines my happiness, or happiness is seeing the other person fulfilled. Okay, so with that, let's stand. And let's pray. Avinu, Malkenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much for everything you're doing in our life. And even as the season of Hanukkah is approaching, Father, I pray that you would work in each and every person here, both to will and to do of your good pleasure. We want to be in relationship with you, not just because we are so pleased with how you meet our needs. We want to be in relationship with you just because we love you and we want to do everything we can for you. Father, we love you even, uh, even when sometimes it feels like you're not with us. Sometimes in our lives, we feel like you're not there, but we know you're there and we know you love us. And Father, I just pray each one of our relationships with you also wouldn't just be based on how because you meet our needs. It's easy to love someone who's meeting our needs, but Father, we love you more than that. We love you regardless, and I just pray you would work in every one of our lives that we would have that attitude of just selfless love toward you as well. And Father, I just pray too that you would bless any uh, tithes or offerings that are coming in Father, because they're coming in to bless you. It's not so you'll bless us, even though we know you bless us because we give. Father, we just want to bless you. And we thank you for allowing us to participate in taking your Torah to the nations. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Welcome back to service. Hello. How's everyone doing this morning? We're enjoying the teaching that so far this morning, and we're, as we find our seats, we're going to have uh, Steve Arnold here, who is Jewish, to read a prayer that is often um, prayed uh, before the Torah, right? Before the reading of the Torah. He's going to read from the Siddur, uh, a prayer that's often read in conjunction with uh, studying the Torah. So Steve. In Kamocha. For Elohim Adonai v'yein kama secha. Malchusacha, malchus, kol olalmim, humem shaltcha, pachol dor vodor. Adonai melech, Adonai moloch, Adonai yimloch, liolom voed. Adonai oz, liamo yitain, Adonai yivoreach, es amo bashalom. There is none like unto thee among the mighty. O Lord, there are no deeds like unto thine. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and thy dominion endures throughout all generations. 
The Lord reigns and the Lord has reigned. The Lord will reign forever and ever. May the Lord give strength unto his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Baruchu es Adonai Hamvoroch, Baruch Adonai Hamvoroch li'olam vo'ed, Baruch ato Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam, Asher b'chabonu mikol ha'amim, V'noson lano es toroso, Baruch ato Adonai nosein ha'toroh. Bless the Lord who is to be praised. Praised be the Lord who is blessed for all eternity. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from among all the peoples by giving us thy Torah. Blessed art thou, O Lord, giver of the Torah. things we do and oh God I can't think can't help but think of so much of the people that call on the name of your son Yeshua all over this world Lord we love you for saving us we thank you for that but what are we doing about the people all around us we should be standing in the gap for your people Israel all over the world Lord those in the land and those out but the church isn't doing it for the most part. Largely, we're preoccupied with ourselves, God, and our own little lives, and we've forgotten that it's not just about us. It's about you and what your desire is. But Father, in these latter days, you're bringing us back, back to your Torah, till we can finally look again at the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yehovah Zevaot. That we can come to know you as the one true and almighty God. You've said over and over again in your word, you're him, you are God. There is no other. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care how many millions might cry out to other names. But we know you are the one and only God. Like Steve prayed earlier in Hebrew, Mi Kamocha, who is like you? Who is like you? There is none. Lord God Almighty. But God, as always, when anything's to be done in this earth, it needs you. You look down and who's standing in the gap for your people? And when you saw that you were alone or there was no one else, and your mighty right arm had to step in. And through the person of Yeshua, Lord, your mighty right arm won salvation. And through all the suffering that he did, Lord, you, you just defeated the enemy and brought salvation. And, and he began the new covenant where you poured out your spirit on your people, God, as many as received him you gave us the power to become children of, of you. But you placed your spirit within us and you put your Torah on our hearts, Lord. But many of us didn't know what that was. We didn't know what was written on our hearts, but as you've revealed your Torah again, we can start learning that. And God, all I say is the church all over this world, not just in America, not just here in Tacoma, the church is sleeping, God. 
wake us up, Father. We know we're getting near the end. I pray, my Lord God Almighty, wake us up as only you can do. Only you can revive your people. You've done it in the past. It's been many years since it's happened here in, in this land, Lord. But you can revive your people. And only that's done by your spirit, God. But every time you do, lost people get saved. That's more people that turn to you and give glory to your son, Yeshua. But God, if you don't do it and wake the church up, I'm afraid the church isn't going to think of the lost all around us. And millions are going to go past us to hell without us reaching out to, to save any. It's almost like we've forgotten how, God. We need to be woken up, all of us, Lord. There shouldn't be any one of us that's not crying out to you to revive the church. And I know, Lord, if you'll do that and the many that will be saved all around us, but how many more then can turn to Israel and your people and stand in the gap? That many more millions, God, that could stand all around the world and stand in the gap for your people. And although as times come, many will lay down their lives for the name of Yeshua, but that's all for your glory. That's what this is all about, God. But don't let us be a sleeping, filthy bride for Yeshua when he comes back. Your word promises he's coming back for a bride that's made herself ready. Lord God, only you can prepare us because we don't seem to know how. Make us ready, Lord, and let the numbers be millions. Yeshua is worthy as we've been singing all this morning. He alone is worthy all honor and glory and praise. And we know he in turns gives it all back to you, Father. Just thank you and praise you for your holy son, Yeshua. And just ask all these things in his mighty name. One of the things we always like to do at this time is to acknowledge visitors who've been here for the first time. So if you've been here for the first time, would you raise your hand? We have a gift for you. The ushers will be passing them by. If you would, raise your hands right over here. Thank you. Let's give them a big hand. <clears throat> we also like to know where uh, everyone's from. Where are you from? Kennewick. Well, that's a long drive. And how about you? Where are you from? Tacoma. All right, and I see a hand over here. Gig Harbor. All right, and over here, Sumner. All right, yes, over there, Olympia. All right, any others? All right. Well, we always love having visitors. And uh, just a reminder, we have our big Hanukkah party coming up in a couple weeks on Tuesday night right here. Yay, it won't be long. Uh, let's see, another thing. Uh, Sarah Sanders, stand up. Say hi to everybody. <clears throat> Believe it or not, she has her own CD finally coming out. That's right. And hopefully we'll even uh, have it uh, here in time for Hanukkah. So it won't be long. All right, let's see. One of the other things I always like to do is uh, I kind of change things around a little bit. Rather than trivia questions, what I've been doing is taking questions from all over the world. Uh, Monday nights, we're spending more time going over questions and answers. But you'd be surprised at some of the questions people have. So I have the list here of several questions that came in, and I'll try to find one in particular for th this afternoon, and then we'll go into uh, the lesson. And Monday night, I'll try to answer some of the rest of the questions. But here's, um, let's see, what's a good one for today? Wow, there, I mean, we get emails from every possible denomination and from all over the world. Okay. Here's one, and I don't know if how many of you have your Bibles, and I don't know what translations you have. You all may have something different. Oh, that kind of reminds me of, uh, of another question. But anyway, <laughs> this one says this. In Luke chapter 6, verse 1, they had a question about this verse. 
Now, depending if you have King James Version or the Young's Literal Translation, it's going to be something a little bit different. In the Young's Literal Translation, it talks about the second first Sabbath. You ever heard of that? What do you mean by the second first Sabbath? And so that's what we wanted to know, you know. Uh, does someone have a King James handy on the front row? I can just kind of go to, yeah, here we go. Okay, here's how it says it in uh, Luke 6, 1 in the King James. It says here, and it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first. Now you might think, well, that must be the second Sabbath of the month. It's the second Sabbath after the first. Now, <clears throat> in, uh, in the Young's literal translation, see, he has four different translations here. They're all different. But in the literal translation, it talks about the second first Sabbath. Now that puts a whole other light on it. What, do you, what can that possibly mean? How can you have the second first Sabbath? Well, what is that? Well, what that does, it's really putting a time place marker on that. Remember, if on the feast days in particular, the three, uh, day, the three feasts when everyone would come to uh, the temple at Passover, Pentecost, you know, in Sukkot, you might have the Feast of Unleavened Bread might fall on a Thursday, and that's a Sabbath. And so here was talking about the second first Sabbath is talking about one of those weeks where you have a Sabbath on like Wednesday or Thursday, and then the Shabbat would be the second first Sabbath. You following me? So what that's telling you is one of the festivals. Now here was, here's another one. I'm going to bring this one up just because it fit in with this. Uh, I'll answer half of the verse Monday night, but here's the other half. He says, I was wondering why your personal preferences of Bibles, like in my notes here, is the King James Version since you use it in the teaching notes. You have made it clear there are so many biases, mistranslations, omissions, and so on in the King James Version. So I can't help wonder why it's still your Bible that you use in teachings. I understand you don't want to promote just one Bible, but encourage us to consult many sources in our study. But many of us have put aside our King James Version Bibles, which tend to perpetuate our old replacement theology thinking and tends to obscure the true meaning. And between the archaic language and the biased translation. Okay. Now, that's a very fair question. Now, first off, I don't know if you guys realized how many pages of notes you have. Can you imagine how long it would take if I sat and typed all those words? I have a program where I can cut and paste. Okay, and uh, now my software has several different translations. Typically, the reason why I use King James to cut and paste is, for one thing, there's no copyright on King James. I don't have to worry about copyright issues. Okay, so that's part of it. Uh, the other thing is, uh, it's just it's easy to cut and paste when you have it on your computer. If I don't have it on the computer, then it's harder to cut and paste. You have to type every single letter. So. Uh, the King James Version, you know, it's okay. I mean, uh, I have King James, New King James, Modern King James, you know, as well as a dozen other versions on my computer. Uh, the ones that I really like, I don't have on my computer that I can cut and paste. That's part of the problem. It, and then the other problem is just the fact that there, a lot of these are copyrighted. Can you believe that? So anyway, so that's the reason why it's not that I necessarily prefer that translation over other translations. Now, one other thing I want to uh, read to you, here is an email I got from Holland. And he says, greetings in the mighty name of our Lord. I'm so glad to be a part of your ministry from a distant. I've been trying to get in touch with some uh, Messianic Jewish congregations here in Holland, but I can't find any. And he says, all of these have something to do with what I've been going through during my brain surgery. He says, Hashem has given me a renewed love for the Jewish people and the land of Israel. I used to pray for God's firstborn of the people already, but after a supernatural encounter at the recovery room, right after my operation, God gave me a passion for his people, which I've never had before. Then he says this. God revealed his desire for me to study the Bible and his Torah from a Jewish perspective. I was led to study the Jewish culture from their feasts, and actually I know it's the Lord's feasts, their calendar, actually I know it's God's calendar, to their wedding ceremony, etc., even to study the Hebrew language. However, I needed confirmations to what I've received since I've always been taught differently. I came from the full gospel Pentecostal denomination. Uh, and he says how he prayed for God's guidance. 
Uh, since then, I've been surfing the web for teachings from that kind of perspective, you know, even going to Orthodox Jewish sites, and I've seen many Messianic Jewish sites, but somehow nothing clicked. I was led to your ministry site. I listened to the videos posted and read the articles and resources I found on your site, and there was a quickening in my heart, and it clicked. All of what I've received was confirmed, and God has since then been revealing more truths to me through your ministry. Isn't that cool? He says, truths that I will probably never learn from a Gentile Christian pastor, nor from anyone from our church, or any church for that matter. I can remember before I was led to your site that I wrote an article for our church regarding the prophetic significance of the Jewish feasts. It was turned down because they are too far-fetched for the members to understand. And the pastor is not certain whether it is biblically sound or not. He said, so I let the matter rest. It's probably not yet the time. A few months later, I accidentally stumbled, I know it was God-led, on your ministry site and read your lessons on the feasts. It confirmed what I've received from Hashem. He says, I want to help my church to understand the importance of the Torah, and as you always say, to bring Torah to the nations. He says, this is the desire for my church. I just don't know where and how to begin. And besides, I'm not in the position to even suggest this. My church is pro-Israel. And although we don't get a lot of teaching like yours, they do have pastors, Gentile Christians who come from time to time to give insights on Israel, Jewish matters and prophecies regarding the land. However, the teachings are milk for me. The teachings are from a Gentile Christian perspective, which I already know. I've always hungered for more from the very moment I became a born again Christian. I've always believed that there's more to God's word in Christianity than what I've been taught. Now I'm lifting up a prayer to Hashem to please send someone who will give us a deeper understanding of the Torah, the Jewish feasts, and propel us to the next level of our faith journey. Isn't that cool? So anyway, that was from Holland. But it's exciting just to see what's going on uh, all over the world. And that, you know, for me, that's, that's what's exciting is to see what God is doing Sometimes we think we're all alone, and we really found this so true on our trip to Israel. People that were, have been following our site, like this person from Holland. Uh, we had people from South Africa and Germany and uh, Canada. They join us, and they feel so connected with us and connected with you guys. And so I just really want to thank you guys. It's you guys that make everyone around the world feel connected, so thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so now... We're going to take another look at our Torah portion. I think everyone has one time in their life read the story of Jacob and Esau. But the other thing is, how about Leah and Rachel? I mean, they were sisters, you know, and what turmoil. So what I want to do now is take a look at a great lesson that can be learned from how Leah deals with the searing hurt of rejection and the seeds sown by that rejection upon the next generation. Think about, I mean, we looked at the rejection that Esau felt a little bit, that Jacob felt, and now can you imagine Leah? Do you think she felt a little bit rejected? How about a lot rejected? Well, the Bible kind of describes the suffering in silent of Leah. In Genesis chapter 29, let's look at verse 29 through 32. It talks about how Laban had gave to Rachel his daughter Bilhah, his handmaid to be her maid. And it says, he went in also unto Rachel and he loved also Rachel more than Leah and served with him yet seven other years. <clears throat> and when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, Surely the Lord has looked upon my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. Man, she is definitely someone who's married but looking for love from her husband. And it says, The Lord has looked upon my affliction. Well, in the Hebrew, it suggests that Leah did not wear her pain on her sleeves. Much the opposite. She only sobbed under her pillow at night, probably every night, that she was rejected in favor of the more beautiful Rachel. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of the Targum, which is the Aramaic translation, but it translates that, that verse 
uh, where it says, upon my affliction, as this. Since my shame has been revealed before God, but not before anyone else. So this image is also reinforced by this very next verse where, see, it's not like Leah went around complaining, being bitter, lotion horror, my husband doesn't love me, this, he, he loves her more. She didn't wear all that hurt and all that pain out in the open. Look at verse 33 of Genesis 29. It says, she conceived again and bare a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I was hated. He's therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. It doesn't say because everyone else has heard that I was hated. It's not like she's been going around telling everyone I'm hated, I'm hated. It says because the Lord has heard that I was hated. So in one sense, the, the world may see a radiantly smiling mother of two sons, but God, he hears the cries of hurt and rejection. And so the, the truth of her feelings are underscored by the fact that she and not her husband named these two kids. Think about it. It says she named them. It doesn't say that Jacob named them. It seems as though Jacob couldn't have cared less since they were not born to his beloved Rachel. So she is the one who's naming these two kids. But here's the other thing. What happens oftentimes when people feel rejected, it gets passed on to another generation. Let's look at the situation with Reuben. Reuben is truly his mother Leah's son. Matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 37, verse 20 through 32, 22, it says, here they wanted to kill Joseph, and Reuben is the oldest steps in, even though Reuben, I'm sure, is upset because he's been rejected and over Joseph. Remember, all the other kids want to kill Joseph. Because he seems to be the favorite, just like Rachel was the favorite over Leah. But Reuben isn't the kind to, okay, well, I'm going to get all upset and let's go get him. What does he do? When they said, come now, therefore, let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say some evil beast has devoured him and we'll see what will become of his dreams. Reuben heard it. He delivered him out of their hands. And he said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, don't shed blood, cast him into this pit that's in the wilderness. Don't lay any hand upon him that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. So here Reuben, you can see, has the attitude, even though I'm sure he's hurt, I'm sure he feels rejected by his father, that he's still going to take care of Joseph. Despite this, there are always disastrous results when a son feels rejected, especially when the rightful heir is pushed aside through no fault of his own. We have seen this in the previous generation, how Jacob himself stoops down to the level of deceiving his father and pretending to be Esau in order to feel, if only for a brief period of hours, the love and acceptance Esau always got from his father Isaac that Jacob never felt. Because Isaac preferred Esau. And you can imagine the rejection Jacob was growing up with in life. And here, Reuben feels the same way. So let's take a look at Deuteronomy 21. We're going to jump into the Torah because I think this is so interesting that there are three quick stories in Deuteronomy 21 in quick succession that you can't help but think of the whole situation of Jacob and Reuben, which had happened like 300, 400 years earlier. In Deuteronomy chapter 21, let's look at verse 10 through 14. It talks about when you go to war against your enemies and the Lord your God has delivered them into your hands and you've taken them captive and you see among the captives a beautiful woman and you have a desire to her that you would have her to your wife, then you will bring her home to your house and look at what it has to be done. She has to shave her head, pare her nails. She shall put the raiment of her captivity from off of her and shall remain in your house and bewail her father and her mother for an entire month. And after that, then you shall go into her. So it's, it goes back to what I was sharing the first half also. God wants to make sure you love that person for who they are, not for some just self-infatuation that you may have for that person, because often that goes away. And then it says this, and it'll be, if you have no delight in her, then you should let her go wherever she will, but you will not sell her at all for money. You shall not make merchandise of her because you've humbled her. Well, then from there, we go to verse 15 and 17, and this you can see directly applies. 
If a man have two wives, one beloved and one hated, and they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated, if the firstborn son be hers that was hated, then it will be when he makes his sons to inherit that which he has, that he shall may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. He shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he's the beginning of his strength, the right of the firstborn is his. Can you see how the, the parallel? Well, then let's look at the last one here. Deuteronomy 21, 18. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father, the voice of his mother, when they have chastened him, he will not hearken to them. And it goes on and talks about what you do with a stubborn and rebellious son. Well, these three incidences, especially as they are juxtaposed together, are ominously reminiscent of both Jacob and Reuben. What do we see? Jacob, through no fault of his own, is duped by a scheming father-in-law into an inappropriate marriage with Leah, who he doesn't love much, just as a Gentile captive woman, through no fault of her own, could become a life's partner for some Israelite. And oftentimes, the early infatuation often turns to hate. Well, Father Jacob is now saddled with two wives, one whom he loves and one whom he hates, and he does favor the son of the beloved wife, Joseph, over the son of the hated wife, who is the rightful firstborn, which is Reuben. Now, what do we see? We see Reuben does commit a stubborn and rebellious act, perhaps the result of being a rejected firstborn, where it talks about how Reuben went and slept with Bilhah, the secondary wife of his father. So you can see all of these three things, these uh, stories being woven together having been played out several hundred years earlier. Matter of fact, feelings of rejection are strewn all throughout the Bible. Cain felt rejected. Ishmael felt rejected. Esau felt rejected. But we also see Jacob felt rejected. Leah felt rejected. Reuben felt rejected. Joseph sure felt rejected. Who else? Who else felt really rejected that you can read about in the Bible? Okay, sure. Matter of fact, and let's look at 1 Samuel 8, 7. Here the Lord says to Samuel, hearken to the voice of the people and all that they say unto you, but they've not rejected you, but they have rejected me. I think one of the, the, the biggest parties in the Bible who have been rejected is God himself by his own people. And so I think God has also strewn the whole story of the Bible with these stories of rejection, and he has made each one of us in our lives experienced rejection so we can have an inkling of what it feels like when he has experienced this rejection. <clears throat> he says that they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. And then let's go on to 1 Samuel 15, 23. The king that is chosen, it says concerning Saul, Samuel is speaking to Saul and it says for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because you've rejected the word of the Lord. He's also rejected you from being king. So Saul was rejected. But here we see not only they did, did they reject God, they rejected his word. And what do we know about Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 3, the suffering servant? He is despised and what? He's rejected of men. He's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As we hit it, were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. So I think it's quite fascinating how we can see this whole story of rejection woven through the Bible. In Hosea chapter 4, 6, it's, God says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Now, how many have heard that verse before? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. But what you have to do is look at these verses in context. It doesn't say or mean my people are destroyed because they don't understand the arts or music or science. What kind of knowledge do the people lack that they're being destroyed? Look at what it says. It says, because you've rejected knowledge, I'll also reject you, that you would no more be a priest to me, seeing you have forgotten the Torah of your God. I will forget your children. Wow. That is a very interesting verse. He's speaking to the priest, and the priests who are the ones that were supposed to have the knowledge of the Torah. He's not speaking to the layman there. He's speaking to the priest, and he says, you're going to no more be a priest to me, 
saying, you have forgotten the Torah. Wow. I mean, that's, that's pretty heavy. I mean, I think all of us want our kids to be remembered before God. And so if we want our kids to be remembered for, before God, we need to remember the Torah. Now let's take a minute, though, and let's see how all of this connects to the Haftorah portion, which is in Hosea. We see in chapter 12, verse 12 and 13, it talks about Jacob fleeing into Syria. It says, And Israel served for a wife, and for a wife he kept sheep. And by a prophet the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, and by a prophet he was preserved. So here we're seeing the, the importance of hearing from the word of the Lord. Now let's look at Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 14 and 15 here for a minute. This is talking about our day. This is a prophecy concerning the prophets here. Let's take a look and see what Jeremiah says. It says, Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it will no more be said, the Lord lives, that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. I think that is such a significant verse. How many of you are familiar with the story of the exodus from Egypt? Everyone's familiar with the story of the exodus from Egypt. I mean, they say it was, I don't know, like three million Jews all within a day are fleeing Egypt. You know, it takes over a week to get out of Egypt roughly and they're across the Red Sea. But that was a pretty big story that happened about 3,500 years ago. I mean, here we're talking about it 3,500 years later about how, how all these three million Jews left Egypt, okay? But God is saying prophetically, something's going to happen that's going to eclipse that. Do you catch that? Yes, there have been Jews all along going to Israel, especially over the last 50 years. But some event is going to happen where there is going to be a massive exodus of Jews from all over the world to Israel. And again, this is something I believe that's going to be massive and could be happening within a week and a half or a month. But let's look at this prophecy. It says... The Lord lives that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north, the lands where he had driven them, and I will bring them again into their land, and I will give it to their fathers. Yes, there's been a trickle over the years, but it hasn't been to the point that it eclipses the Passover. So I believe something huge is yet to happen. But the main thing we need to see in the book of Hosea, God is speaking to Israel, and he's telling them to remember Jacob. Uh, I mean, Jacob had his share of struggles. And he says, remember that God is the one who's faithful and God is the one who's going to deliver you. And then he also is basically saying, remember your preservation is in obeying and returning to God through what the prophet says. And so we need to really realize how important that is. Now, one thing someone wanted me to mention that I'll go ahead and bring up now. How many of you, I mean, many of the people that went to Israel with us a couple of weeks ago, we were in Itamar, okay? And here is Itamar up on the hill. And this is where the Fogel family were murdered, right there on Itamar. And while we're standing there, we're literally looking just down at the bottom of the hill, across up the next hill to the city of Awarta. And this is where the Arab family came from that murdered the Fogel family. Well, as we look a little bit to the left, there's this other little hill where they had just dedicated a brand new synagogue. As a matter of fact, Moshe had to leave our group because there was this big ceremony of dedication of uh, people to come and dedicate the synagogue. And there were a couple of homes that were built. It was just a little outpost on the other hill. Well, I don't know how many of you heard, but just the other night, it was completely destroyed. The synagogue, all the homes, uh, totally leveled. Now, you might say, who did that? Well, the Israeli government did it. Now, now, everyone's thinking, what is going on here? Okay. Well, here's the thing, and I want to explain this. It, it, in one sense, it's complicated. In another sense, it's uh, easy to explain. First off, one thing that we have to realize, first off, is even though sometimes we may not agree with the government, we still support the troops. Make sense? Okay. Even though a lot of times I don't necessarily support the government of Israel, I still support the troops and the people of Israel. Make sense? But here's the thing. They, they do know over that that it is what is called like a tit for tat or whatever. They did build it without permits, okay? 
And even America, with our satellites and our State Department, they get on Israel's case every time they add a porch. And so they knew the possibility was there that it could be destroyed because they did build it without permits because as far as they were concerned and those that went with us on the trip to Hebron, uh, it's, a, it's, it's amazing sense that these people have. We're not moving. We're staying here. God has given us this land, and they believe in God, and they're trusting God. But then you have a secular government who, I mean, how many of you know the ACLU does not appreciate the church here in America? Okay. Well, this is, this is the problem, so you know how to pray as well. Why do you think in 1967, when Israel captured the Temple Mount, the first thing they did was give it back to the Muslims? because the secular government didn't want the religious people telling them what to do. Okay, so the, the greater problem of having a temple rebuilt in, in Israel isn't going to be the Arabs. It's going to be the Israeli government that's going to want a religious system set up. That's where the bigger battle is. But with that said, let's look at Hosea chapter 13, 6, and 7, and we can see how that even relates to us here. It says, according to their pasture, so were they filled. They were filled and their heart was exalted. What happens as a result of that? They've forgotten me. And I think that's what happens so often in our own lives. I mean, like when 9-11 happened, everyone, I mean, the church attendance went up for at least three months, then went back down again. But all too often what happens when we... Uh, have all this abundance, like what's happened in America over this last generation, what happens? A heart gets exalted, and we think we're the ones that uh, have the power to get all this wealth. When the prophet plainly says, God says, I'm the one that gives you the power to get wealth. And so what happens is this, and this is the same thing with Solomon. What do we see? Solomon, he was exalted, and he forgotten God. And it goes back again to the, the whole Song of Solomon. Even as Greg was praying about the church of sleep, a lot of people don't understand the, the whole book, the Song of Solomon, is about the sleeping bride. And then she ends up waking up and works the harvest at the, at the end. But let's look at Hosea 13, 6 and 7. He goes on to say, Therefore, I'm going to be to them as a lion and as a leopard. By the way, will I observe them? So here, God is saying, I'm going to be like a lion in Hosea. Well, look what it said earlier in Hosea chapter 5. I will be to Ephraim as a lion, as a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. I can't help but think of 70 AD when the whole temple was destroyed. This is a prophecy about Messiah saying, I'm going to come, I'm going to tear, and I'm going to go away, I'm going to ascend to heaven. And then it says, and none will rescue him or Israel. And then he says, I will go and return to my place. This is specifically talking, I believe, about Yeshua. He says, I'm going to come, I'm going to tear, destroy, I'm going to return, go back to my place. And he's going to remain there in heaven until they acknowledge their offense, seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. And they will say, come, let us return to the Lord, for he is torn, he will heal us, he is smitten, he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. Well, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. So this is saying after 2,000 years, he will revive us. That's exactly what happened in 1948. And then it says in the third day, he will raise us up and we will live in his sight. That's the third millennial reign when he's there, the resurrection of the dead while living in his sight during millennial reign. This is, a plain, uh, this is so plain in the text. Well, one of the interesting things that I saw where it talks about in their affliction, they will seek me early. Well, do you remember what Leah said when she conceived her first son? She called his name Reuben, for she said, Surely the Lord has looked upon my affliction. Therefore, my husband will love me. And what does Reuben's name mean? See a son. And so I believe a time is coming in Israel's affliction, they will look and see the son. Hosea 14, 9. It says, Who is wise? And he shall understand these things. Prudent, and he will know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. The just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall therein. Do you realize what that is saying? This is saying that the ways of the Lord are just, right? But look what it says. The, well, it says the ways, of the, the ways of the Lord are right, 
The just are going to be walking in the ways of the Lord, but transgressors are going to be falling. So the same thing that we walk in, Torah, others are stumbling. I want you to look at this picture for a minute. For Christians, the Torah is a stumbling stone. For the Jews, Yeshua is a stumbling stone. All Christians know that Yeshua is a stumbling stone for the Jewish people. Well, I believe what this verse is saying right here concerning the ways of the Lord and the Torah, the just are going to be able to walk in Torah, but transgressors, they're going to fall. And I think a time is coming when both the veil is going to be removed over the Jews and the Christians, and they are going to realize it's the same stone. They're both stumbling over the same stone. Yeshua is the Torah. He is the living Torah. <clears throat> so I believe that time is coming. You know, here we're getting all of the Jews' case. You don't realize Yeshua is the stumbling stone. And then we're stumbling over the Torah. And it's the same stone. So this is why I pray that all of the veil would be moved over everyone. Let's stand. And as the musicians come forward... And let's pray. Avinu Malkedo, our Father, our King. We pray you come. Father, uh, this world's a mess, and it ain't going to get right on its own. It's going to need you. It's going to need your direction. So we pray that you would come quickly. And Father, I just pray right now that each one of us would realize how much you love us and that we begin to truly love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, that we would truly wake up and get to work and realize how short time is, that Father, our focus needs to be like a laser upon the, the work that you have for us to do. We just thank you. Come quickly. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. And what a blessing it is. God truly wants to bless us and show each one of us how much he loves us and how we are to be part of his family. So he told Moses to tell Aaron, here's how I want you to bless my people. I want you to say this prayer over them, and in so doing, not only will I bless them, but I will place my name upon them. And here's what he told him to say. Ivarakaka Yahweh, Vaish Mareka, Yaer, Yahweh, pan of Eleka vihuneka. Ye saw Yahweh, pan of Eleka viasem laka shalom. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom, Bashem, Yeshua HaMashiach. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, go and be blessed. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries. Be blessed and shalom.